um, in the fortunate position to have three distinguished scholars speaking to us today. They are in alphabetical order. Dr. Douglas Field, senior lecturer in 20th century American literature at the University of Manchester and co-founding editor of the James Baldwin Review um, with a distinguished list of uh, publications. Dr. Doug Sikama, who is assistant professor of core studies and English at Redeemer University, also an editor at Front Porch Republic and a senior fellow in research at Cardus. Ralph Wood, um, who I believe will be joining us, but has not yet logged on, uh, something momentarily I think that will be fit, uh, solved, uh, university professor of theology and literature at Baylor University, where he teaches in the Great Texts program and serves, among other things, as an editorial board member for both the Flannery O'Connor Review and Seven, an Anglo-American literary review. I am not mentioning all of their distinguished publications. These are already appearing in the chat bot button at the bottom of your screen so that you can see them all with help helpful Amazon links and you can buy them all or order them for a library or something like that. So what we're going to do, each of them in al alphabetical order by last name will be presenting for 12 to 14 minutes. There will then be a guided Q&A and discussion I might pose some questions myself. They can pose questions to each other, but most importantly, you, the audience, can pose questions by the chat or the Q&A buttons, um, which I will then pass on to the uh, speakers. They can also look at them. I'm not doing them in chronological order. I'm just doing questions as they seem like they might support a fun conversation. That means if your question doesn't get answered, send them to me afterwards. Um, I will then forward your questions to the panelists so they can have the option of answering them. You, but you don't need to worry about your question not getting answered during these 90 minutes. And I will just also say, this is being recorded. Uh, it will appear on the National Association of Scholars uh, YouTube channel, ideally within 24 hours. So this will be available for posterity. Um, so Anything you say can and will be held against you, but we think hopefully for you instead. On that note, uh, Professor Field, may I ask you to begin? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, very, uh, very nice to, to be here and, and good evening from West Yorkshire in the United Kingdom on a chilly evening. And thank you very much for inviting me to say a few words about James Baldwin's first novel, Go Tell Out on the Mountain. Um, I've got a few notes, but I, I'm not speaking from uh, prepared remarks, but uh, there are a few quotations that I wanted to draw on. Um, and just to say quickly, it's an honor to participate and to be in such august company. Um, and just a, not really a plug, not for any of my, my, my own publications, but the, the journal that David mentions, James Baldwin Review, is open access. Um, it, it's free and it's very important to us when we started the journal in 2015. So it's, uh, uh, you can access it at, at no charge. Um, when I was thinking about some remarks for this event, I had in my mind the Irish writer, Colm Toybin, who's an excellent scholar, uh, although he's not an academic, and sometimes that helps, on Baldwin. And this is what Toybin says about Go Tell It on the Mountain. He says it was much as much a landmark in American writing as James Joyce's Dubliners was in Ireland, which is a really strident comment. So Toybin doesn't really tell us why Go Tell It on the Mountain is a landmark novel, but he tells us that religious background and his sexuality gave him the flesh and the devil was a great subject. And, and that's something I'll return to. So just to repeat that, religious background and his sexuality gave him the flesh and the devil was a great subject. And that's from an essay in his collection, Love in a Dark Time, which came out in 2002. Now, Tobin doesn't tell us either how Bourbon's first novel, which is set over one day on John Grimes' 14th birthday, how and why it's perhaps Bourbon's tightest novel in terms of structure, a late modernist novel in which Henry James and the King James Bible walk hand in hand. Tobin does, however, suggest that Go Tell It in the Mountain was a story that Baldwin had to tell. And those of you who, who've read the novel may have also read other iterations, earlier iterations of uh, what became Go Tell It on the Mountain. And these include 
in my father's house, the death of the prophet, Roy's wound and the outing. So there's a real urgency here. Baldwin, who had uh, lugged this tattered manuscript around for 10 years before he completed the novel in the small Swiss village of loesch le bain or Lukabad in Switzerland, had tried desperately to uh, almost to exercise this story. And Baldwin, as many of you will know, was a Pentecostal teacher, uh, a preacher, teacher or preacher, preacher in this case, in his teenage years. And age 17, his stepfather, David, gave him an ultimatum. You either need to preach or you need to write. And thankfully for us, Baldwin chose to write. And while critics have often argued that Baldwin abandoned the pulpit in favor of the desk and rostrum, much of the power of the novel, I believe, comes from something which isn't secular. It comes, I think, from the tensions between Baldwin's disaffection with the church as an institution. But, uh, but I don't think this is the same thing as a disaffection with a notion of God. Although the notion of God, as I'll explain a little bit more or, or I'll posit, is a little bit complicated. It's not necessarily straightforward. I'm going to say a little bit more about this very large question later on. But I want to tie into the theme of today's session on Baldwin and the great American novel. And I want to go back to an essay that many of you have probably read. John William de Forrest, a novelist and World War uh, sorry, and Civil War veteran, and his essay, The Great American Novel, published in 1868. So in the aftermath of the Civil War, de Forrest called, as, as you'll know, for a great American novel. The picture of ordinary emotions and manners of American existence. And he was quite picky about this. Hawthorne didn't measure up. He didn't quite get there. And the closest example that he could find was Harriet Beecher Stowe and her novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which achieved, he wrote, a national breadth to the picture, as well as plenty of strong feeling. Now, how does this tie into Baldwin? Well, Baldwin, as some of you may know, made his name as an essayist with his piece, Everybody's Protest Novel, first published in Paris in a little known magazine called Zero in 1949. And in that essay, he famously claimed that Uncle Tom's Cabin was a very bad novel. Those are Baldwin's words. He criticized in particular Stowe's portrayal of the eponymous character. And he objected to the suggestion that African-Americans be passive in the face of white violence. But also he criticized Stowe's depiction of Uncle Tom as a Christ-like figure, suffering and dying at the hands of Simon Legree. So on the one hand, I think Baldwin would have been deeply suspicious of this notion of the great American novel. He was deeply suspicious of many things which claimed to be universal, to avoid uh, his notion of what was complex, which, it runs, which is at the core of his work. We see this in his critiques of the American dream and American innocence. But since he's not here to, uh, to argue with me, I'm gonna conclude by offering up a few remarks about why I think Go Tell It on the Mountain is indeed a great American novel. First, as I mentioned, I'm not convinced that uh, I'm not convinced by critics who claim that Baldwin swapped the pulpit for the pen, or that he's dismissive, or that he is completely dismissive of the church in his first novel. Much of Baldwin's writing is preoccupied with, with religion, or perhaps more accurately, spirituality, a belief in, in something, perhaps God, that has been corrupted or sanitized by religious doctrine. And I think, too, it's important for, to, to sort of answer back to, cricket, to, to critics who claim that Baldwin became increasingly secular. You know, religion and spirituality courses through his work right up until uh, his last bits of writing. And if you're that convinced that you're agnostic or atheist, uh, you don't really need to keep on saying it. So as late as 1985, in the, in the introduction to the price of the ticket, Baldwin wrote that once I'd left the pulpit, I had abandoned or portrayed my role in the community. One of the novel's chief strengths, I believe, is Baldwin's attempt not to dismiss the church outright, but to repurpose it 
That is to change it from a religion in which the flesh is mortified into one in which love, including touch, is a cornerstone of a way of understanding God. So in the novel, in contrast to the broad way and the narrow way and the insistence from the church community that there's no halfway with God, Baldwin explores the tensions between God, love and the church. And it's here, I think, that there is something great about the novel. Um, we see this in Baldwin's descriptions in Go, in Go Tell It in the Mountain of religious ecstasy, which are written in a language suggestive of sexual union. And we see this in the whispered desire that John has for Elisha. And while the homoeroticism is muted in the novel, readers of early drafts noted how Crying Holy, one of the early drafts, were much more explicit about John and Elisha's relationship. And indeed in the Schomburg uh, Center, uh, part of New York Public Library, there, there are quite a few manuscripts of Baldwin's work. And one of them is a draft of Go Tenet on the Mountain. And it's much more explicit. So the relationship between John and Elisha, which is kind of hinted at in the novel, is much more explicit in these early drafts. And friends of Baldwin who read it, including Emil Kapoya and the poet Harold Norse, were, were very clear that early drafts were much more uh, explicit about a sexual relationship between John and Elisha, but one that happened within the church. So there's this really brave coupling uh, or exploration of a homosexual love that, that is happening within the church itself. So the power of the novel, at least part of what it makes it a great novel, I'm suggesting, is that Go Tell It on the Mountain is driven by powerful tensions that reverberate through the novel. And this, I think, leads us on to one of the great themes in Baldwin's wider work. And this is the theme of love, which is, hasn't been written about uh, a great deal in his, in his work. And it's quite a difficult thing, I think, to write about. I think literary critics tend to struggle when it comes to theorizing what love might be. But I want to make it clear that love in Baldwin's work is not to be confused with sentimentality a feeling uh, or, 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 or an expression that he explicitly warns against. And second, his definition of love is explicitly active and political, echoing Cornell West's warning that a love ethic has nothing to do with sentimental feelings or tribal connections. And Martin Luther King Jr.'s insistence that love is not to be confused with some, with some sentimental outpouring Baldwin explicitly points out that by focusing on love, it does not mean anything passive, but rather something active, something more like a fire, something which can change you. I mean, a passionate belief, a passionate knowledge of what a human can do. So I think in many ways, it's love beginning with Go Tell It on the Mountain, uh, which becomes the cornerstone of Baldwin's work. And it's one in which love, in a sense, becomes his idea of a religion. And, you know, throughout his career, beginning with Go Tell It on the Mountain, Baldwin is very careful to separate the idea of the church, which, which he sees as deeply flawed and often a repressive institution, and the notion of love, which is nonetheless spiritual. So Baldwin... Uh, in one remark, uh, claims that the notion of the uh, Immaculate Conception was blasphemous because, he, as he said, what's wrong with two people who love each other making love? And Baldwin's, I think, work, beginning with Go Tell It, challenges us to rethink our conceptions about love, spirituality, and religion. Um, I'm going to conclude there to let our esteemed uh, other panellists uh, have their words. Thank you. So very much. And then we'll go straight to Professor Sikama, uh, if you would be so kind. Hey, everyone. Sorry, just getting uh, unmuted. Thanks, uh, David. And thank you so much, Dr. Fields, for uh, that. Like you said at the beginning, um, it is my uh, distinct pleasure to be uh, invited here as well. And I am joining you from Southern Ontario uh, here in Hamilton. 
<clears throat> uh, and I'm joined with two men, I think, who have maybe forgotten more about Baldwin uh, than I might ever know. Uh, so uh, I'm just grateful to be, be part of this. Uh, I, I wondered at the beginning, um, what could I as a, a Canadian, not to mention a, a white Canadian, bring to someone like James Baldwin? Uh, I'm really no expert in Baldwin, but my area is contemporary American literature in the post-war uh, era, looking specifically at writers who talk about belief in the secular age, uh, which I'll talk about um, at the end of this. And I know we were told not to have prepared remarks, so I've also made a few notes and uh, I'm gonna read some quotes here from, well, one quote from, from the opening section, uh, because to talk intelligently about a novel that's this complex in only 10 minutes is a, a challenge in itself. So I wanted to think about that question, right? How do we situate Baldwin as a great American novelist? And um, as Dr. Fields, I think rightly suggested, Baldwin would probably be a little bit reticent or, or skeptical about such a, a framing. But I thought it's actually interesting that sometimes it can actually be forgotten that Baldwin is a novelist. Um, in preparation for this, I watched the 2016 documentary, um, I Am Not Your Negro. And it's almost posed like Baldwin is a philosopher, an intellectual, a public intellectual, an activist or a polemicist, all of which he undoubtedly was. But there's not really a mention that he's an artist, uh, that he's, he's a novelist. And one of the things that made Baldwin as successful and profound a voice as he was in the civil rights era was the sort of craft and genius that he had. One that was, um, as I wanna show, rooted in the American tradition of letters, um, a tradition he was very aware of, even though he spends most of his writing life in a kind of self-imposed exile in Europe. So his debut novel, uh, Go Tuttle on the Mountain, uh, he started writing that at 17, again, as, as we heard. Uh, it took him almost a decade to finally publish it. But in that novel, we actually see some of the sort of perception and some of his craft um, as a novelist that I, I wanna look at. So we didn't really uh, talk to each other too much before this. So part of me, if there's a little bit of overlap, I might sort of hop over some of the pieces that uh, uh, Dr. Fields already uh, addressed. Uh, but maybe it's because I'm a little bit self-conscious uh, here as a Canadian commenting on James Baldwin that I'll maybe kick us off by looking at that Canadian Americanist, Sakvin Berkovich, who was actually one of the pioneers of American studies. Uh, and his work that I'll be referencing uh, is his book, Puritan Origins of the American Self. And I actually think it's, it's a helpful sort of entryway in understanding this particular novel and how it fits more broadly within a sort of distinctly American tradition of writing uh, while potentially sort of subverting that tradition. I know subverting can be sort of this uh, doctoral grad school kind of word. I do think it should be forbidden, um, but I'm gonna use it in, in this context. So Berkovich's argument, to paraphrase it, was one uh, that said sort of the legacies inherent to American letters uh, gave the colonies this sort of rhetorical sense of themselves um, as a sort of typological understanding of the self and of America. And that is, Berkovich says, the self in America was always a type in this sort of grand arcing narrative of Christianity, one which gave them a sort of resonance uh, with individuals or events that you would find in the Old or the New Testament. Um, we could probably talk for a whole hour about the sort of temporal and theological implications that allow this kind of hermeneutic to work, right, in our individual lives. But this, uh, Berkovich explores, <coughs> is a sort of biblical hermeneutical practice that the first Puritan settlers would have been steeped in. So in writing about their sort of divine errand into the wilderness, some of the earliest writers layer this American experiment with biblical motifs, their nation set apart, their anointed, a city on a hill, a light to the world. Uh, many of these um, motifs, um, if you've read the novel, you'll, you'll notice that they occur frequently in Baldwin's sort of rendering. And you don't actually have to scratch too deeply uh, to see how some of these tropes and ideals persist uh, in American rhetoric today. So the American self, Berkovich argues, is never just sort of an isolated self, but it's a type, it's a, a microcosm of the macrocosm that is America, this chosen people. So whether it's Walt Whitman or Emily Dickinson, Ben Franklin, or if it's not too irreverent here, someone like Stephen Colbert and his hilarious, I am America and so can you. There's this rich centuries long tradition of seeing the self as a sort of type of the nation. 
This is maybe obvious in a writer like Walt Whitman, um, whose Leaves of Grass is a long meandering exploration of the body of America and of course his own body. Whitman's song to America and to himself is steeped in this sort of Puritan legacy of biblical reading. Now, just who gets represented um, in America, what selves count, was always something contested. So writers like Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, and of course, Martin Luther King Jr., they also used the biblical narrative, this kind of typological reading, to challenge the majority white culture for the glaring hypocrisies of a nation that was indebted to the exploitation of black bodies and cheap labor, well, and free labor. So what individual sort of made up America, what self again typified the state is expressed uh, quite beautifully, if not painfully in this well-known poem that I'm sure some of you have, have read at some point by Langston Hughes, uh, I too sing America. So let me just read that, it's a very short poem, I'll just read that for, for us. <clears throat> so I too sing America. <coughs> I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and I grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table. When company comes, nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Hugh's poem or this sort of song has a grief and a latent anger in it that he has to sort of wait longer. And this frustration with waiting, or I think in, in the language of, of Gotella on the mountain, right, of tarrying, uh, is something that suffuses some of the best writing of Baldwin who was writing about half a century later and like Langston is still waiting. So when Baldwin zooms in uh, on just one day in the life of John Grimes, um, his 14th birthday, or also as we hear at the end, his second birthday, because he has this encounter with the Lord, he's sort of born again on the threshing floor. We're not just getting a sort of semi-autobiographical account of Baldwin, which of course we are. Uh, but we're also reading a novel that's steeped in a Black American Christian tradition that's employing language, motifs, symbolism that are familiar to white American ears, but also meant to challenge them and flip their self-understanding on their head. So Go Tell on the Mountain is Baldwin's insertion of his own uh, particular experience in Harlem into this American tradition of letters. <coughs> and you can't really read Go Tell It on the Mountain without sort of hearing or seeing, uh, well, hearing uh, for, for the symbolism, the echoes of T.S. Eliot and the sort of modernist manifesto tradition and the individual talent. Now, one of Eliot's arguments is that the best writers, and of course, Eliot is uh, making a defense for his, his own work here. They write from what he calls a, a historical sense in which they hold together the pastness of the past. And they also show how it endures and it permeates the present. So for Eliot, the writer injects him or herself into the tradition that's shaped them, but then the entire tradition is shaped by their insertion. Uh, as one of my best Eliot professors noted, <coughs> we might think these ideas actually came to Eliot in sort of the rarefied air of Harvard under the uh, sort of discipline of Irving Babbitt, but Eliot's best poetry and his thinking about poetry, even in this essay, was actually from the music hall and from uh, his encounters with jazz. The influence of jazz, and of course, we know the blues, is something that's also very pervasive in the, the writing and thinking of, of James Baldwin. So part of the tradition that Baldwin uh, is sort of actively writing against is, as uh, we've already kind of looked at, this protest novel in American letters, um, like Uncle Tom's Cabin. <coughs> so Baldwin is decidedly against these caricatures uh, that are sort of propped up to give us a sort of pamphlet slogan, right? Slavery or racism is evil. What Baldwin wants to do, and I would actually say he accomplishes this in Go Tell on the Mountain, is to pay attention to the complexities of real humans living in a fraught, racialized reality that is mid 20th century America. Almost every character that we come across in the novel is complex and they refuse any simple adoration or condemnation. Yet each is sort of unquestionably shaped and I would say misshaped by the dominant white American culture that holds black and black men and women in various forms of contempt and oppression in the novel. Now this contempt Baldwin is showing doesn't occur in a vacuum. It won't simply leave with the abolition of slavery or the ending of 
Jim Crow laws. And <clears throat> I'm sure we can get into more of a discussion around this. Is, is Baldwin optimistic about change or not? But one of the things he wants us to see is the novelist is not a pr propagandist or a, a pamphleteer. He wants us to encounter the reality and the experience and dwell sort of in the tensions that John, Elisha, Florence, Deborah, you name it, um, experience in the novel. The novel really is giving us this encounter. As Baldwin says elsewhere, not everything we encounter can change, but nothing can change if we don't encounter it. So the persistence of the past into the present is the thing I think that Gotel on the Mountain is helping us encounter. And if we think about it at that sort of 30,000 foot structural level, you can see that Baldwin is quite self-consciously playing with this notion that we see in Eliot of a historical sense through John Grimes. We're getting sort of one day in the life, it's almost like James Joyce's Ulysses, um, of this important sort of threshold day as he sort of comes of age in America um, in, the 19, in the mid 20th century. In a speech that Baldwin gave uh, entitled The Struggle, and again, I'm sure some of you have seen this, but his, uh, it's a really remarkable debate he has with Bill Buckley. <coughs> he, he talks actually about this kind of threshold moment of coming of age in America. He says, this is a moment where, especially for black boys and girls, they realize that the mere America holds up to them is not them. Uh, and he says it in a, a passage that's, that's beautiful and, and kind of haunting, but he says, the place that you've pledged allegiance to does not pledge allegiance back to you. Um, and he says, this happens again when you're between 10 and 14 years old. So in John's story, he notes sort of in this opening section that's called the Sabbath, that it's when he was five and the white teacher sort of noted his intelligence. He began to understand himself as a self, as an individual. But more than this, he now had this weapon, his intellect, his ability to write and think that he could use against his black father who despised John um, for his desire to sort of be connected to the world of white America. And this sort of creates in him this Du Boisian sort of double consciousness, one that kind of pervades the novel, particularly for John, right? His desires are shaped by Christianity and America. And he doesn't see these things um, as synonymous uh, entities. So the mountain, of course, uh, is a pervasive image throughout the Bible. It's a site of prophetic declaration. It's a site of an encounter with God. And in the Dantean sense, which I actually think infuses this novel as well, it's the mountain of purgation or purifying fire. Uh, early in the novel, we get sort of a first glimpse of this image when John is uh, heading into New York City, right? It's his birthday and he thinks everybody's forgotten. And it's one of the most beautiful, tender scenes where his mom remembers and gives him some money and says like, go spend it. Um, and he doesn't spend it wisely. But I, I just wanna read this little bit from uh, page 31 in my book uh, where he, he sees New York City. Again, this sort of city on a hill. And when he reached the summit, he paused. He stood on the crest of the hill, hands clasped beneath his chin, looking down. Then John felt like a giant who might crumble the city with his anger. He felt like a tyrant who might crush the city beneath his heel. He felt like a long-awaited conqueror, at whose feet flowers would be strewn and before whom multitudes cried Hosanna. He would be of all the mightiest, the most beloved, the Lord's anointed. He would live in the shining city, which his ancestors had seen with longing from afar. It was his. The inhabitants of the city had told him it was his. He had but to run down, crying, and they would make, take him to their hearts and show him the wonders his eyes had never seen. And still, on the summit of that hill, he paused. He remembered the people he had seen in that city whose eyes held no love for him. And he thought of their feet so swift and brutal and the dark gray clothes they wore and how when they passed, they did not see him or if they saw him, they smirked and how their lights unceasing crashed on and off above him and how he was a stranger. All right. So notice, right, he ascends the hill <clears throat> and he's framed as this sort of colonizer, a conqueror, a god. This is sort of an Augustinian moment um, where his libido dominandi, this sort of lust for power, wants to be realized. Uh, but he's been brought up as a child to believe that this world, this sort of shining light, this city on a hill, could be his, right? Um, again, he pledges his allegiance to it. But when he comes down the mountain and he enters the city, right, he realizes he is not welcome there. This is not 
his home. The city doesn't pledge the allegiance back to him. So it's important to realize that New York in this sort of black theological tradition is not synonymous with Zion. Uh, when George Floyd died several years ago, um, we had uh, at our campus, uh, a black theologian, Esau McCauley from uh, Wheaton College. And he noted, and he's actually written a book about this called Reading the Bible While Black. It's a wonderful book. Uh, that it's common to understand oneself in this tradition as the Puritans did, as sort of new Israelites. But the difference was in the black tradition, it's the Israelites in bondage in Egypt. So white America in this kind of figuring and one that's clearly shown throughout Gotelab on the mountain is not the shining city on the hill. It's Babylon, it's Assyria, it's Egypt, it's Rome. The people of God are really the slaves and the descendants of slaves. And there's hope in worshiping a God who comes in the flesh. And he's ultimately, and this is Esau Macaulay's framing of it, he's lynched, right? America <coughs> is the embodiment of oppression, of power, materialism, excess, decadence, sin. And all throughout the novel, right, we see Gabriel, John, Roy frame the dominant culture of America, the one that fears and hates them, in these kind of terms. So they're also wary of this sort of... <coughs> psychological colonialism or maybe Stockholm syndrome that's made them desire an acceptance of their captors, right? Toni Morrison's Bluest Eye in uh, 1970 will kind of explore this. It's a continuation of this tradition that, that Baldwin is channeling. So in Goats on the Mountain, the, the pervasive dominance of sort of white America is the backdrop, which inform almost all the voices of that middle section, the prayers of the saints. These are really the ghosts or the flamed tongues of Pentecostal fire, which is really interesting because that's kind of the counter of the Babel of Babylon, um, the meaningless speech uh, of the dominant culture that can be sort of heard amidst the confusion. And these voices are speaking from the past and they form John in the present, a boy whose name sort of connects him to John the Baptist, the preacher in the wilderness preparing the way for Christ, or John the anointed blessed disciple set apart who has these apocalyptic revelations. But each voice is simultaneously formed and deformed by the narrative of America and the narrative of Christianity. Each of them makes sense of who they are, filtering through these sort of two lenses. And this sort of leads them either to like a humble acceptance or a frustrated rage, or as we see in almost every story, some form of untimely death. So I noted at the outset of my research, just in, in closing here, because I know uh, we got to kind of keep to our time, <coughs> that... I'm fascinated by questions of belief in this sort of supposedly secular age. Um, Charles Taylor, another Canadian, uh, by the way, uh, he's done a lot to frame discourse on secularism in his sort of massive tome, A Secular Age, which has shaped uh, American literary studies in the last 20 years in, in pretty important ways. And he looks at how belief is sort of fragilized, the word he uses, in the disenchanted world. And it's hard when we get to the novel's conclusion, the threshing floor, um, John is finally gripped by this ambiguous something. Uh, and we wonder, can we trust this or not? Is this real? And in some ways, John seems to have this kind of porous self. That's another word from Charles Taylor, um, where he says the modern self is sort of buffered from the transcendent, but the pre-modern self or the enchanted self is, is porous. And John seems very porous. Right? He's, he's overcome. He's taken uh, uh, over by a spirit. And we see that the way Christianity and belief deform its adherence radically shaped Baldwin, right? A man who not only became a preacher like Johnny, and I know uh, Dr. Fields mentioned this, uh, after such a, a, an experience, a conversion, but he walked away from, from the church, right? He lost sort of faith in what he called the theatrics of Christianity or organized religion, um, a religion that often helped people manipulate others in, in really dangerous ways. And Baldwin later noted, right? He could only worship a God who could open people to a more capacious kind of love. And I, that's why I really liked, um, again, what you said, Dr. Fields, about this, because I do think that's sort of the beating heart of this novel and, and, and of other writings that Baldwin has um, given us. So a key component of post-secular forms of faith is that these easy lines between belief and unbelief, faith and doubt, Christianity and atheism are really blurred. And these cat categories are actually much more complicated in this novel. So as the novel closes, John has to kind of come down from the mountain, his experience where he encounters God. But then he ironically has to kind of keep striving to run up the purgatorial mountain to stay pure. And we wonder right at the end of this, 
if anyone hears uh, the ambiguous it that is being cried on top of the mountain or being told on top of the mountain? Is anybody experiencing the sort of something that should change them forever? And when John descends, right, he sees his unsmiling father looking at him and then his mother welcoming him. And then he notes he's on his way, right? He's back in the middle of things as all of us always are in a world that's unaware of his epiphany and one that's likely going to be just as cruel and oppressive as it was before this day of rebirth began. So, thanks. Thank you so much. <clears throat> now, our third panelist does not as yet seem to be here. So we are going to go straight to questions and answers. And I do encourage uh, the people who are listening to send stuff in. Um, I guess I will start with something on the cadences and the prosody of it. That is, I mean, so when I read it and I was struck, um, and as, as Professor Sikkim has just been you know, mentioning, you know, the sermon cadences of it. But I guess I would have said what struck me was not just you know, how it reflects the black sermon tradition, but you know, the broader cadence and prosody of American sermons, you know, religiosity. And would this not in point of fact have been a way to speak and join with a, you know, an audience, both white and black, both of which have their own sermon traditions and for which the general, how should I put it, the general religious awareness of sermons, their prosody, their message is much, much broader than, than now. Um, so in fact, is he, is he using the um, cadences of the sermon to speak to both blacks and whites and to utilize the traditions of religious prosody, you know, from you know, the Scarlet Letter onward uh, for a joint and mixed audience? For either of you, uh, I, I Doug from Doug to Doug. I'm usually Doug as well. I, 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 do you mind if I say a few words and then hand over? Um, yeah, thanks. It's, it's it's a good question, and it's it's very important that we touch on on the craft of of, of this novel. Um, I think you know, I, I one of the striking things about uh, Baldwin is that when uh, you know when people try and look at his influences and antecedents, Baldwin never really makes any claims to, uh, to, to the traditions going back to, say, the Harlem Renaissance, even though he was taught by, by County Cullen. Uh, you know, he's born uh, as the Harlem Renaissance is, is, is really getting underway in Harlem, of course. And Baldwin cites his influences as, uh, as the Bible, the King, but specifically the King James version of the Bible, and Dickens. And, uh, you know, those are his two main uh, kind of influences. And then he says rather, you know, uh, rather strangely, it, it might seem that, that Henry James, uh, and in particular, his novel, mm. Princess Casimassima, he says that was one of the novels that helped him break out of the ghetto, which is, which you don't often see tweeted. Uh, you know, there's, certain, I think, I think um, Doug's point about the- Lionel the Trilling would be proud. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, the, the way that some versions of, 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 of Baldwin uh, get kind of, uh, we, we get used to certain versions. And, and, and so, for example, Ralph Peck's film, I'm Not Your Negro, where we have, I thought it was an excellent point about the way that we see a particular version of Baldwin, but we don't really see him as an artist. And I think that's the same with 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 uh, tweets about Baldwin. We, we get a particular version of him, um, you know, through, you know, through Black Lives Matter movement, which is, which is incredibly important, but it tends to kind of position Baldwin in, 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 sometimes in, in a slightly uh, a, a kind of, uh, almost one dimensional way. So I think in terms of just to kind of, just to kind of say a little bit more and then I hand over to, 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 to Doug. I think that your, your, your point about the kind of dual audiences is absolutely right. And I think on the one hand, Go Tell it on the Mountain is a, an extremely important novel about the black American experience, um, that, that he's working from a, tra a particular tradition. But in terms of the, 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 the language and rhetoric, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, so in a sense, and you know, it's fascinating to see how then Baldwin shifts from Go Tell It on the Mountain, which is so important as a work about, um, uh, you know, set in the 1930s, uh, about the, uh, about Harlem and that period. And then his next novel, uh, Giovanni's Room, has essentially no black characters and it's, it's set in, 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 in Paris, in France, not Paris, Texas. 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, so, so we have this kind of shift and it's we're, we're, you know, we become aware of Baldwin's ability to shift very cleverly between different audiences and registers. And, and just as a final point, uh, you can see I'm getting excited now. The, uh, one of the, one of the, one of the um, striking features of his early essays is this shift between uh, th this notion of I that Eddie Glaude picks up nicely uh, in his book where this I becomes something ambiguous. When Baldwin's saying I and we, is he saying we African-Americans, we Americans? And it becomes a, a really fascinating uh, and, and ambiguous reference point. The other Doug. <laughs> From Dr. Doug, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. that that's really helpful. I don't have much to add to that. Uh, Mine is one of the writers that I'm really fascinated with currently is Marilyn Robinson. Um, so in Gilead, a similar idea, right? It's, it's written from a sort of pastoral voice, a father to a son. And you do sort of get the idea, like that sort of thing, the, the cadence of the sermonic through that. But again, very much in the sort of Puritan strain that obviously Robinson is working out of for her audience. Um, I don't know much about the sort of Pentecostal uh, tradition, which I think is very different, but as someone who has obviously attended different churches, um, there's a lot in here that registers with me, um, obviously, about how he's doing it. One of the things that, that's fascinating is his just jumping into the sort of sermonic very quickly, right, uh, where you'll get all of a sudden lines from Isaiah, lines from Jeremiah, um, and even I find it fascinating when he debated Bill Buckley, uh, right? He comes, he says, I'm here as a, I'm here as Jeremiah, right? And, and you get this sense of a, a prophetic voice that is, that is almost like a medium channeling a spirit that can get out of control. And I, I'm actually surprised reading this again, how quickly he moves from a very sort of mundane realism where it does feel kind of like Joyce's Dubliners into the kind of mystical transcendent. And I'm like, how did we get here? Like, so quickly and there's this kind of again cadence of us moving into different like realms of experience and reality uh that i actually think is very indicative of the, the black church movement the pentecostal movement um that that uh obviously is informing baldwin's own early experience and and these, these characters thank you i'm going to build on a question from richard morgan when in fact asking for comparisons and contrasts between um, Baldwin, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, you know, all of an age. Um, but you, know, you were mentioning earlier how Baldwin didn't like to be cabined. Um, indeed, as you know, Ralph Ellison put it in the bell in the jar, you know, he has opened all the influences. I guess my question would then be, what, who is he playing off of amongst his contemporaries for which I will then add, you know, uh, say, Penn Warren, uh, go tell, uh, not go tell a mountain, all the king's men, or um, uh, James Cousins, guard with honor. I mean, in fact, there is all this stuff being written in the you know, late 40s. I'm presuming he's re reading a certain amount of his contemporaries. How is he building off of the stuff just written right then in America by his fellow authors, black and white? That's uh, a it's a, a, a very good question. It's not a question that often crops up, at least that I'm aware of in, in Baldwin scholarship. And it's one you know, which, I, which I haven't thought about for a while. Um, I think in terms of particular authors, I mean, I think there's certainly, uh, you know, perhaps an obvious case, but it is, is Baldwin's relationship to Richard Wright. So in the essay that I mentioned, Everybody's Protest Novel, which was published in uh, a very small magazine called Zero, uh, it was later republished in Partisan Review, but Zero was a uh, was the first post-war literary magazine to be published in English uh, after the Second World War. And uh, in that um, first volume, uh, Baldwin uh, Baldwin's essay, Everybody's Protest Novel, was uh, published, and Richard Wright's uh, short story, The Man Who Killed the Shadow, which seemed kind of strangely prophetic because it was in that essay that Baldwin, in a sense, severed his relationship with Richard Wright. So I think that there's, there's a strong sense from uh, several of uh, Baldwin's early novels that he's he's kind of, that there's a kind of Oedipal moment where he's, uh, you know, slaying Richard Wright on, on some level. At least that's how it's often interpreted. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. And so he has an admiration for Wright, and it's Wright who actually 
supports his, uh, it's a Eugene uh, Saxton Fellowship, which enables Baldwin to go to Paris. Um, so he, when, when Wright was still living in Brooklyn, Baldwin uh, brings his, his uh, dog-eared manuscript and, 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 and Wright reads it and, and sees, promises in it, sees promise in the manuscript, uh, writes the fellowship, and that's really kickstarts Baldwin's career. Um, but I think, you know, for, for Baldwin, as, as, as his uh, writing a, a, about Richard Wright explores, there was something um, dangerous about the way that Wright privileged polemic and, 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 and more broadly politics over craft, which was a criticism that would haunt Baldwin later on in, in his own career. But he's certainly a springboard, I think, for, for, for Baldwin's career, uh, as well as, you know, going back a bit further, uh, novels such as Uncle Tom's Cabin. In terms of other contemporaries, uh, you know, we, we get a little bit of a sense of, of who Baldwin was reading. And in fact, he, he, he was a big Eliot fan. I, I, I've been lucky enough to read quite a few of Baldwin's unpublished letters, um, some of which are, are, are available at the Schomburg. Others are uh, illicitly, you know, smuggled around uh, Baldwin enthusiasts because they're, they're, they're unlikely to be published for various reasons. Uh, yeah, and Eliot is actually uh, prominently there. Um, in terms of other people he's, he's he's reading, I'm not entirely sure. You know, and it's it's it, and it's great to be asked a question uh, like this that, that that's going to get me, you know, uh, kind of going back over my notes uh, later on. We do know that Baldwin was a prolific reviewer, and he was incredibly well read. In fact, he 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 claims that he, uh, you know, by the age of, of of about thirteen or fourteen, he'd read everything in his local branch of the New York Public Library. And when he says everything, he meant everything, you know, so not just uh, books on, on literature. So I think that would be actually a, a really fascinating uh, project to kind of look more closely at that. Um, Doug to Doug. I was going to say, you're really the Baldwin expert here. And if, if this somewhat stumped you, which I, I, I mean, I, I don't know on top of that. I mean, I did read a little bit about Baldwin's uh, reading of Eliot, especially in some of Baldwin's poetry, um, where he actually has a few riffs off of the wasteland where he's writing like a post-World War II sort of version of it. And this is actually a question I have uh, for you, uh, Doug, uh, is, is, was he also reading Joyce? I, I get a sense just from Gotel on the Mountain, it seems very much like Joycean in terms of one day like Ulysses, but it's also like a Kunstler Roman, like a, a portrait of the artist as a young man. Um, and there's so many resonances with like everything from Dubliners to portrait to Ulysses that I see in this novel. And I'm like, I, I don't know enough of Baldwin to know if that's really there, but it just seems everywhere. Yes, he does. He, he certainly does uh, mention Joyce sort of early on in his career. The other person I omitted to say was Hemingway and, and The Sun Also Rises was particularly important for, for Baldwin. Uh, and, and those of you who have read Giovanni's Room uh, might see some parallels between the two novels. But what's striking, I think, is, is how um, infrequently Baldwin kind of name checks other authors. You know, that's why, uh, David, your question is, is particularly good. Uh, because, you know, I'm sort of, you know, scratching my head thinking, you know, quite literally now thinking, you know, who, who else, who else? Um, and and it's, it, it's, it's not very often that he does uh, mention authors and certainly not in a kind of favorable way. You know, we, we know often younger writers tend to, uh, you know, like younger writing critics tend to kind of be a little bit more vicious to, to make their name. Mm -hmm. It was V.S. Naipaul said, you know, young critics uh, are like mangoes, they're bitter and, 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 and they grow riper and sweeter as they grow older. Uh, and the same can be true of, 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 of writers. Um, so that, you know, I think, uh, but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, Dickens, uh, Dickens, the King James Bible, uh, a bit of Hemingway, a little bit of Joyce and Eliot, uh, those seem to be his, his sort of main states in terms of people he references. I love the fact Dickens, in fact, in, in one of his earliest publications for his high school magazine, called The Magpie, uh, he writes about Dickens in London. You know, you've got, I mean, it's kind of wonderful. He's so, uh, he's so enamored with Dickens. Um, and yet he's very ambivalent about Britain and British culture, um, you know, for, 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 for a number of reasons. I have another question, which I'm going to take advantage of the two of you not being Americans. And this is an interesting question for me. Does, for a non-American reader, how does that shift how you read him? Does he seem you know, very American to you? Um, 
in ways that might not be so obvious to American readers where you tend to see the internal differentiations. And I might ask, what does he give in particular to the non-American reader? Well, I, I, I don't mind starting off uh, on this. Yeah, because one, one of the things I find really helpful um, with Baldwin, and I should say I'm, I'm half American. So my dad's from Michigan. So I don't know if that counts for anything. I, I grew up here in, in, in Canada. Uh, but the thing that Baldwin, I, I find that's really helpful that he, he gets us to ask ourselves is what is the kind of dream of the nation you want people to sort of subscribe to, right? When you talk about equal access or privilege or, um, right, you're actually giving a sort of version of the culture that you want the black culture to sort of live into and then things will be fine. And Baldwin like repeatedly will say in his writing, what if I don't want that? What, what if I don't actually want to desire the world that you've created? And I actually think there's a lot of things that he shows us in Go Tell on the Mountain about sort of the New York City of sort of, again, materialism and decadence and things like that, that he's saying like, is that really what we want to live into? Uh, in a Canadian context though, I think what's helpful for us to realize, because I think one of the things that we can do as Canadians, especially when we look at uh, Americans is be sort of smug and self-righteous. Um, be that we were sort of the end of that great underground railroad um, into our country. The North was sort of symbolic of a place of freedom. Uh, and that actually inhibits us from like dealing with our own ghosts uh, and, and actually how we've dealt with race uh, in Southern Ontario, in Canada. And, and on top of that, I'm actually only about five kilometers away from a massive uh, reservation where we have segregated indigenous populations uh, living on reserves uh, that, are, that are constantly resisting um, some of the, again, the dominant uh, Canadian culture that we have. So I, I find some of the stuff that uh, Baldwin is referencing in like 1960s Civil War era America, it is very American. I'm, I'm not saying it's the same thing, but there's sort of truths and principles to it that resonate still here in 2020. Like that, that past, again, persists. Uh, into the present that we still occupy here in, in Canada. And I do, I actually think ca Canadians are maybe more immune to seeing the problem because we do tell ourselves when we look at Americans that we're a lot better. <laughs> we, we've dealt with things a lot better than, than you guys have, um, so. Yeah, thank you. And I, 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 you know, I find it uh, kind of, um, I'm, I'm learning all the time. You know, I, I've been, been reading Baldwin. Uh, in fact, Go Tonight on the Mountain was, was the first novel that I read in. Uh, 1997, which sort of kickstarted my interest in, in Baldwin. And, you know, I think when I started out, uh, you know, as an undergraduate, it was, um, sorry, my computer is just, uh, there we go. Um, yeah, I, I, there was a, a, a lot that I needed to, to, to sort of, you know, grapple with and understand. And, you know, I, I hadn't lost that uh, notion that it's important to be, to, to kind of enter into this uh territory uh with humility and, and and to really make an effort to, to 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 understand the material culturally um i think for for, for me baldwin is uh particularly american uh in the sense that it's um his work is, is really preoccupied as 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 other doug said younger doug i think we should refer him uh, uh, to <laughs> um with uh, not yet gray doug with with um the notion of complexity and I think that's a really important part, as I see in a lot of the best American uh, cultural artifacts. Uh, but at the same time, I, you know, I think in Baldwin's insistence on the need to um, disavow the notion or disabuse the notion of innocence is particularly uh, important. He sees in, in American culture this big Edenic um, kind of tradition where uh, the cornerstones of American culture are on this idea of innocence. And, and that's a, a central theme that Baldwin, uh, you know, tears up and, 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 and you know, throughout his work. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think he, he, he's both someone who's uh, particularly American, but, but similarly perhaps to his great um, hero, Henry James, with his transatlantic perspective, there's something where his Americanness uh, becomes uh, you know, uh, like Whitman, vast and, 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 and full of contradictions. Uh, and, and, and there's something, you know, really exciting about that. So 
Um, I don't mean that in, in, in a kind of um, way in which there's a kind of uh, a link to a kind of American empire sense, but, but in the sense that his own notion, I think, of Americanness is, is deeply changed by the years that he spent in uh, not only uh, Paris, but the south of France and, and in Turkey, as well as, you know, he referred to himself as a transatlantic commuter. Um, and I think that's something that's really important in terms of Baldwin's work, because his own perspective uh, was on America was was um, was needed. He felt he needed some critical distance. And at times, I feel you know when I've been reading Baldwin that, that it's been useful to me to 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 to, to have to kind of um, think about things that perhaps um, uh, you know if I was had been living in America and brought up in America that I would sort of take for granted. So that's why I try and read Baldwin is, is, is with a kind of critical distance echoing perhaps his, his um, removed from America. One sees one country from a better place uh, with distance, uh, he says at one point. So I have one Canada comment and then I want to follow up on this um, a bit on remove. I just, I, I'm going to throw it out to you that the greatest Canadian work on America is Robbie Robertson, The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down, which is a uh, somewhat different point of view than Baldwin's. Um, having said that, um, you mentioned earlier the writers he liked, uh, T.S. Eliot, um, Henry James, uh, Ernest Hemingway, these are all exiles from America, voluntarily so. Was he already fond of them before he emigrated from America? And in fact, is he already twigging on to this broader American tradition of we are Americans, but we are exiles, you know, even before he actually does it himself? Um, yes, I mean, he, he was certainly reading those authors uh, before he left. I mean, he was very young, though, when, when you know, he was born in 24, uh, he's, uh, it's 1944. He's only uh, kind of mid twenties by the time he goes to France. But he, as I mentioned, he was uh, a voracious reader uh, and, and reviewer. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think your point is absolutely uh, spot on that he, that he aligns himself with writers in exile. But I think for Baldwin, there's a sense in his writing that even before he uh, experienced uh, or chose this self-imposed exile. He already felt in exile uh, from the United States, you know, this notion of, of the color line that Du Bois talks about. And so, so there's a kind of sense already uh, that uh, he's someone uh, looking from afar into the country of his birth. So I think your point is an excellent one. So, so perhaps, you know, there's a kind of intuition that, you know, in the way that we often gravitate towards things that we have an affinity for. And then we kind of realize afterwards that, you know, this, that then it becomes a kind of narrative that, uh, as we look back on it. Um, yeah, good, uh, an excellent point. I think the, the few things I've, I've read in his interviews and reviews is one of the things he also noticed is how race becomes a different thing in France. Uh, it, it's, it's ignored in different ways that people are more indifferent uh, to him than, than, than being sort of in the midst of it in Harlem or in America. And again, like uh, other Doug is saying, um, I don't want to say Gray Doug, but uh, <laughs> uh, that that right, he he becomes aware of like how much that is like a racialized world, in, in, and and it's probably a little bit maybe falsely idealizing um, some of Europe, given what we know the 20th century is going to be doing, uh, right? But uh, or has done, but still, I think he's getting that that critical distance to see like. Why is being black in America such a different thing, right? I'm gonna say, by the way, Professor Wood has just logged on. I'm afraid there's been a mix up. We've actually been on for about an hour. Uh, so, but um, playing things by ear, I actually introduced you already. Could we interrupt to have you give your talk on what you were going to say uh, or on, um, uh, uh, on James Baldwin? I, I know this is a little, uh, you know, interrupted, but given that you, you are here, may, may we take advantage to have you speak? Sure. Professor Wood? I'm not clear about the question. Oh, sorry, the sorry, sorry. We've actually been speaking for a while, so, um, but I, and we're actually up to the Q&A, and I was wondering if I could uh, interrupt that and then have uh, you give your talk now on... on um... At the start? Yeah. Saying? It was an hour in. Uh, we actually started an hour ago. Oh, really? What? Yeah. I thought and there, there may have been some time zone a mix up, I'm afraid. <laughs> 
Uh, but I yeah, was, we, we, I thought it was 2 p.m. Central. I did not oh, know. 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Oh, I am. Uh, oh, good gosh. Yes, well, I know. Um, sorry. Well, we have just. <laughs> We have been having a, a lovely discussion focusing, among other things, on, I think, the biblical cadences of uh, uh, James Baldwin, his novelistic innovations, and how he works in both uh, in the tradition, all you know, you know, American tradition, Black American tradition, and indeed broader traditions, since we have, uh, you know, people from uh, you know, England and so forth, uh, Canada being able to give us... But um, since you were, may I ask you then, well, so uh, Professor Field, Professor Sikkim, is there anything you would want to say briefly about what you said to just sort of provide an orientation? Well, I was going to talk about the way in which um, Baldwin should not be included as a token Black writer for the sake of diversity. He is what? a first rate writer in his own realm. And so there's nothing about Baldwin's work that requires any kind of condescension. On the contrary, it requires the greatest kind of honor. What I found to be most profound uh, about Ghost Hunter on, on the Mountain, I read it years ago and then again reread it, is the way in which Baldwin um, gets inside Pentecostal. Christianity in the black world and that race as such does not play. I, I gather I, I'm contradicting what has been said before, <clears throat> a central role, except of course, in the death of Richard who commits suicide rather than live in a world um, where these be the, the white policemen simply assume the guilt of these black boys and of course, assume his own guilt. That crops up there, but really not much elsewhere. So he immerses, he immerses us in the world of Black Pentecostalism, both sympathetically and critically. Uh, on the one hand, he sees the enormous power of um, Black Christianity in this Pentecostal form um, that it gives to its adherents. Found um, community of faith that's a refuge against the hostile world. And that hostile world, of course, is Lenox Avenue. It's not simply the white world or the suburbs, it's Lenox Avenue where all kinds of, he calls them by their name, evils are being committed. And uh, they avoid that world and find in their own lives a kind of uh, a hope they could not find elsewhere. And the question the novel raises, it seems to me, is how authentic that hope really is. Baldwin is haunted by the great suspicioners, as Paul Ricoeur called them, Feuerbach perhaps being chief. His religion simply a projection of human subjectivity onto the blank and empty cosmos so that there's no God there. And we simply invent him uh, in order to escape our own limitations. And Baldwin, it seems to me, has a double answer to that. On the one hand, this world is real. It is not fake. It is not artificial. Um, their God is reality. Their God is not one whom they have projected into existence. And they have what is no doubt to be called a profoundly experiential Christianity. But therein lies the problem. Because after the turn to the subject from Kant forward, everything real is to be understood from within the subjective realm. Alistair McIntyre calls our whole world emotivist. Um, and it is, it isn't just this black world, but 
seems to me you see the limits of emotivism uh, as McIntyre describes it in this black Pentecostal world. One of them is of course, it's rigid moralism. Everybody is either saved or damned and you're saved or damned according to whether you have been prayed through to the conversion that last John Grimes experiences. The chief sins, of course, are all primarily sexual. There is therefore about this kind of Pentecostalism, something that Baldwin is offering a, a radical critique on. As for example, in the love between Elizabeth and Richard, there's something sacred, holy, real, good about that love, even though it's illegitimate. Of course, resulting in her impregnation and eventually the birth of John Grimes himself. But when you limit the world of sin and evil to a carnal spirit, um, as Baldwin's narrator calls it, and that is a phrase from the New Testament, but the word carnal in the New Testament is the word sarx, S-A-R-X, meaning of the flesh, not S-O-M-A, of the body. Because um, in the New Testament, to have a carnal spirit is to be weighed down with the requirements of the body so that all other things um, have no, no, no real registration. They are irrelevant. They are not to be taken seriously. And I, you can, it's pretty obvious that Baldwin finds that profoundly unsatisfying and thus um, offers his critique of it. There are far worse sins and he does get at them. And the chief center in this regard is of course, Gabriel Grimes himself. And it's not just that he is a hypocrite <clears throat> proclaiming one thing and practicing another. The problem is that he, from the start, sees religious experience as a means of power, of authority, of control, the way he can hold others in subjection, though none of this is conscious to him. The problem is he can't hold John into such subjection. John is a rebel. John will not live in that kind of um, radically constricted, small-minded world. And so he's trying to get out and he does get out, but not entirely because that great final section, I suppose you've talked about it, the threshing floor, <clears throat> an image of course, in which the wheat and the tares are mixed, but then are separated uh, is itself profoundly ambiguous. John is prayed through and thus has what appears to be conversion. But the question is whether it will last, whether it's temporary, whether it's doomed to a quick ending because its roots are in, again, one's own subjectivity. Baldwin deliberately leaves that question open because he doesn't want to coach the reader into drawing one conclusion or another, but rather to involve the reader in helping the reader see this young man now at 14 can go either way. He's been prayed through and he's thus in the kingdom. But on the other hand, he has talked so much and at such great length about darkness and about the way in which um, the evils of the world haunt him and cannot be escaped. And so he's coming to, it seems to me, although hinting his way there, that what he's really learned to embrace is the complexity, the ambiguity, the contradiction 
that is life itself. And um, therefore the only open question is, will this Pentecostal faith suffice to meet that kind of ambigu ambiguous, complicated, contradictory world or not? And Baldwin doesn't provide an answer. He lets us draw our own kind of conclusion. However, 10 years later, it seems to me Baldwin has seen that precisely because the greatness of Go Tell It on a Mountain lies in its complexity and ambiguity, that that will not finally suffice. And so in the fire next time, he lays it out. If I may read just one passage because it seems um, to me to be where John is headed. And Baldwin hints that. This is uh, the fire next time, page 43, pretty early. The person who distrusts himself has no touchstone for reality. For this touchstone can be only oneself. In other words, the sovereign self becomes the arbiter of everything else. Such a person interposes between himself and reality, nothing less than a labyrinth of attitudes. Not one, not two, but again, a complex mixture likened to a labyrinth. And these attitudes furthermore, though the person is, unused, is usually unaware of it, are historical and public attitudes. They do not relate to the present any more than they relate to the person. Therefore, whatever white people do not know about Negroes reveals precisely and inexorably what they do not know about themselves. That strikes me as what one might call, because we have the editor of the Baldwin Review um, to be quintessential Baldwin. And so it seems to me he turns then after the greatness of Gotha on a mountain to the now hard won, hard fought, noble, admirable humanism that has to finally leave that kind of religion behind. Shall I stop there? <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, well, do either of the uh, do either of the two Dougs want to respond to that directly? I could I can pose a question, but let, let's see if the panelists want to talk. I just want to say uh, briefly, I thought that was a, a, a beautifully eloquent and elegant uh, a, a kind of, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. I, I, I was uh, very uh, much kind of uh, pinned to my seat. Listen to that. That, that was wonderful. And I think, it, you know, I agree that, that the quote that you read is absolutely quintessential Baldwin. And I think what you said about the, the kind of ambiguity of the ending is absolutely right. That's certainly the, the way that I've read it. And we were talking uh, along those lines, uh, perhaps not as eloquently uh, before you joined us. Um, and I think you've, you know, to my mind, you, you've, you've kind of um, got to the heart of, 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 of the novel. It's one in which... Um, there's, I think in Baldwin's work, I would just add it in Define Next Time, which is a really important work because it, you know, for many critics, that was the, the moment when Baldwin, Baldwin was reborn as a secular writer. Uh, and, and yet within that very essay, there is uh, some striking language about the awe of the church. You know, he talks about the music of the church and, and, and how and he writes about it with such or, and I think that word is important, that it says to me that there's something that Baldwin hasn't quite let go of in terms of his fascination with um, the, the church. I completely agree, uh, Professor Wood, with your, uh, your, your notion that Baldwin kind of moves from uh, the, out of the church into um, other more humanistic concerns. Uh, but I think it's 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 important to remember that the church continues to fascinate Baldwin on some level. And, and I, 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 you know, the quotation that I read was from in my talk was from the introduction to the price of the ticket, the collected writings from 1985, where Baldwin still 
saying, you know, once I once I left the pulpit, I'd abandoned my place uh, in, in my community. So it's sort of there. And I, and I kind of I sort of think, you know, when someone protests too much about something, you often <laughs> well, find. Yeah, could I it's... interrupt by affirming that? Yes. He has the Bible down inside and out. The overt references, um, you can look up, he's quoting them literally, but the covert references, there are all kinds of hidden metaphors. I'm hidden in the sense that they're not direct. For example, fear and trembling is a biblical phrase from Philippians. We work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Uh, the hymns, I grew up singing those hymns I know them by heart. Um, and they are for Baldwin so clearly formative uh, for the very awesome reason you are just hinting at or suggesting that as Augustine said, a prayer sung is twice prayed, that there is a power about music and its lyrics and about scripture and its meta narrative of the whole cosmos story. And not least of all, again, those, um, those hymns that I begin to sing along <laughs> with, uh, with uh, Baldwin as he, uh, he, of course, he drops phrases here and there. And you don't get rid of those. Those are in your DNA. Uh, if you've uh, experienced them as a youth, you, you don't forget them. They become points of reference that you don't want to get rid of. Uh, you, have, you don't outgrow them. Um, yeah, I discovered one thing in rereading this book that really <laughs> floored me. Most people in this country, I don't know about England, elsewhere, most people don't know about black masonry. You know, the Masonics are these crypto-Christian um, uh, members of an organization and the blacks went out in imitation of whites and formed their own black masonry. So when it says they met in the Lodge Hall back there in Georgia, he means the, the, the Masonic Lodge Hall. My wife and I were visiting a small black cemetery in my little hometown in Northeastern Texas. And there were Masonic references all over the gravestones. See, Baldwin is, is is so um, steeped in the real, he doesn't have to make things up. Uh, he gives them, of course, an imaginative depth that mere realism couldn't give, but these are things he knows um, to his very core. And so I agree with you totally. Far from getting beyond that, they continue to register until his death. Just to, yeah, in relation to that, thank you, uh, Professor Wood. That was, uh, it was, it was really uh, enjoyable to listen to. And I, I really liked how you sort of framed too, what, what, one of the things that Baldwin is doing is just attending to religious experience. Um, I know uh, Dr. Fields, you mentioned sort of his leaning on Henry James, but there's also, I think that influence of William James and varieties of religious experience, uh, right? That, that, experience is one of these avenues in the kind of post-secular, secular age by which we can actually talk intelligently about belief. And I, I do, I really do appreciate at the end that Baldwin doesn't just discount that real experience he had of conversion at 14. Um, and one of the things he says later, I, I, you probably know better when he gave this speech, but it's called The Struggle, um, when he's talking about the artist. And he says the struggle is really to take all of these experiences, encounters, and not to just discard them as if you can become a new kind of self. But it's like the artist's struggle is to take all of that into this long, never-ending process of becoming fully human, right? And, and that's really what the art form is about. And that's why I do like, even with the way the novel ends, I, I agree, it's really ambiguous, but it's that he's on his way, right? That he's, he's, just, he's just continuing again, kind of in the middle of things towards something else. But yeah, that's the question. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm curious to, to explore that a little bit more, but that idea that the something he encounters on the threshing floor is not just a projection of a kind of biblically addled, 
Pentecostal mind, right? It does seem to be like something real did happen there. Um, but we don't exactly know what. Could I affirm that by uh, your reference to William James's notion of what he calls the once born and the twice born? The once born are those who are quite content to live in the world as satisfied worldlings, uh, embracing the, the best values as they understand them of the age or the time, and being quite content to live at that basically horizontal level. But the twice born are those who are not satisfied with the horizontal, who want to plunge deeper and to reach higher. And Baldwin is that person. He is the twice born, whether you take simply the conversion scene or you take his whole life and work. He lives out of that twice born um, condition that gives his work such depth as the once born <laughs> don't necessarily have. I have a question I'm going to pose on a somewhat different topic, if I may. And this, with any, this may be the last question before we then have closing comments, just given the time constraints. Um, novelistic imagination. Uh, he's not just doing a semi-autobiographic novel, after all. He has a number of scenes set in, you know, the Jim Crow South, you know, a generation and more earlier. Now, I gather that, you know, some of this is reflecting, you know, family stories and so on. You know, but this is, in point of fact, the act, the creative act of a novelist, a historical novelist, evoking, you know, a time and place he does not know. Um, I guess I would want to ask, how do we evaluate? What is distinctive about his historical imagination? How successful is his historical imagination? And can we, can we have like a shout out or at least an evaluation of him, not just as somebody recycling autobiographical material, but as a man, a novelist of imagination? Well, that's the key word. Imagination transforms, reorders, rethinks the ordinary into the extraordinary. And Baldwin is not only the master of that, but we need to know Baldwin made repeated trips. Well, of course, you got the editor of the Baldwin Review. He made repeated trips to the South, mm. not in order to find out how evil things were down here below the Mason Dixon, but to discover how complicated they were. So there's one scene, and when he's gone back and recorded his Southern tour that has really struck me as a Southerner, and that he says, um, the only people who will look me in the eye in the South are white men, because they know what I know. And that is we have each other's blood running in our veins. And he means by that, of course, that most whites, plantation owners, plantation foremen, or simply plain white ordinary citizens had concourse, indeed intercourse, with black women. And that Baldwin, though not in any sense a direct product of such intercourse, is in the ultimate sense a product of it. He said, they, they knew that my blood was in them and I knew that their blood was in me. He goes on to say, I felt a strange kinship with these men, not horror, not contempt, but we were one in an odd way. So there you get the bald one who's not simply crying out as he deserved it to, against the evils of racial injustice, but seeing, again, the complication of these things. These people are not simply evil through and through, because they can look at me and I can look at them and know that we are kin. Thank you. Uh, one of the other Dougs, perhaps? I, I, I just a brief, but that was that was again lovely to to, to listen to. Um, 
I think in terms of the imagination, I think I'm very pleased, David, that you, that you raised that, that we you know that we should think of Baldwin as um, as an artist, uh, not just as someone who um, writes about particular themes that, that that we find pressing and pertinent. And, and I, I, as you were saying, that, I was thinking about how how Baldwin describes um, in a couple of essays, particularly Stranger in the Village, his own experiences of as a, of writing the novel, which is a, a place I've been to in, in Switzerland. A small village, uh, Lukabad or Lower Schleban, depending whether you whether, whether you use the French or, or, or the German name for the small village, and Baldwin uh, describes going there. So, so uh, in a way, it's you know it couldn't be further removed from from his upbringing. It, it's it's a tiny little village. I mean, it's quite quite nice now, quite shishi, but it wasn't then. Uh, you know, very little electricity and so forth. Uh, the, the 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 people there had never seen. Uh, anybody of African descent there at all so they had no sense and you know they're trying to get him to ski because they think it'd be comical and it's, it's this kind of this, uh, there's a kind of sense that he's deeply he's kind of troubled by it but on the, on the other hand he, he, he kind of understands it as well but he describes taking Bessie Smith records there uh, and, and listening to them on, on the phonograph and it's there he says that he begins to dig back into his past he hears the cadences of Bessie Smith and, and I think you know the 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 um uh, and that helps him recreate, he says, uh, the, the language of, of, of his youth. And that's as he's finishing the novel. Um, you know, and I think that's you know tremendously important. You know, at the sense that he's he's as far away as he could be, or so it seemed. Uh, but then uses uh, you know music, uh, which which is uh, which, which uh, Professor Wood talked about in relation to Augustine. So 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 in terms of you know singing hymns, so so importantly. So. Yeah, I think, you know, th that sense of the imagination for Baldwin is is really important, but it's one that's based on on some sense of reality, um, which is not quite the same thing as saying he's he's just sort of um, repurposing his own autobiographical experiences. But but his imagination stems from um, these deeply rooted experiences. And Baldwin says, just as a final point, that, you know, he was almost born in the South, uh, you know, but his, his, <laughs> his, 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 you know, his, his mother uh just made it up in time you know so 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 he feels this kinship uh in in, in, in this sort of and i think uh professor was point absolutely right it's not just to he doesn't go to the south just to 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 point his finger but he does absolutely want to understand the complexity and i think you know that works through and with his imagination professor Sikama? yeah that, as you're talking um Dr. Field. It made me think of the, the Beatles documentary that's just out, if you're watching that, Get Back. Uh, and what's really fascinating is when they're trying to like make something new, they go back to like Elvis and Barry, and then it just spawns new things. So anyways, your talk of him listening to these records uh, reminded me of that. In terms of the, the question, and this maybe connects to something you were saying, uh, Professor Wood, about uh, like race isn't necessarily uh, primary in this. It's more about the experience in the Pentecostal church. I don't know if I'm maybe getting you exactly right, but you're saying that that's not sort of dominant in, in, in the novel. One of the things I, I like about the craft of Baldwin in this like early novel is just how restrained he is. He's not like beating us over the head. It's actually a lot of the like little subtle details that are telling us about the reality in which these characters are existing. So like, why is Gabriel so filled with rage, right? Well, part of that is his, his character, but part of that is also a world that has been largely affected by acts of like pretty extreme racism and oppression right like his frustration even with like Deborah who is barren or that barrenness is obviously at the hands of the gang rape that she endures right the frustration of someone like Frank is because of this lack of employment right so there's all these details about like why are these all of the young men hanging around the city what are they doing and Baldwin never like gets into that but there's just this uh again broader social political uh, reality that's like in all the little details around why, especially for the men in the story, it seems like there's a lot of like frustration and pent up energy and a, a, like a desire to do something, but it's, it's foiled, right? Even that scene where uh, Gabriel is walking through the city too late at night and he sees a bunch of white men, you could just sense the fear, the tension, and he has to smile, right? He has to kind of act like everything's fine and then he sees Royal um, and he just says, hey, be careful out here, right? It's those little little details, I think, that are just all over the place. So while he's not giving us the Uncle Tom's Cabin kind of caricature, um, there is this kind of subtle pressure cooker that's like all around 
almost every interaction that that's happening again which i think speaks to i think the kind of beautiful restraint of his craft that he's giving us in, in the novel which really allows him to do what he wants to do which is look at the complexity of these these characters but these characters are not in a vacuum they're, they're living in a very specific time and place that again uh is there for us if we're kind of attentive to those little details could i add again once more to the truth of what you've just said and that is that Baldwin has black preaching down to its bare essence. And if you've never heard black preaching, you've missed something really quite glorious. It's called, they use the phrase call and response. So the, the black preacher will make claims and the uh, congregation will say, amen, yes, brother. He didn't have a lot of those, but he has some of them. So that if you've heard black preaching, I heard it not simply by growing up in the South, but actually as a graduate student at the University of Chicago in the 60s. And of course, I was on the South Side where there are um, a lot of black churches and the television carried black services. So I got to hear black preaching uh, there in Chicago via television. And Baldwin really knows and is able, and again, the subtlety of it is so, these people are not idiots. This preaching is uh, eloquent uh, and in its own way is profound. But it's, as you say, it's subtle. He's neither turning them into esthetes who simply play with language, but neither is he turning them into mere kind of, um, oh, uh, hecklers who is simply propagandizing from the pulpit, do this, do that, don't do the other. Um, those sermons are, are just, they're authentic. Thank you. I, I'm going to just interrupt. We have reached the end of our appointed time. I, I will, however, uh, stretch people just a little bit longer. If they can, if I could just have like perhaps a last one minute comment from each of you again, and I think alphabetical order, and then I'll just you know, wrap up and say goodbye. But one minute last from each of you, starting with Professor Field. Um, well, I, I just I, I would perhaps um, reiterate the point that for me it's a it's a novel which is very much a, a, about complexity, which is something that we, we we've talked about, and 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 just to uh, underscore the ways in which uh, love uh, that that difficult notion to define seems to to be the most troubling, but also the, the most uh, wondrous aspects of of Bourbon's life and work. Thank you, uh, Professor Sikama. Yeah, uh, my takeaway, just sort of immersing myself in the last like week again back into Baldwin's work is um, you can't help but be confronted by just a voice that is unbelievably wise and urgent and passionate and, and needed. And uh, you asked this question earlier um, about what does this sort of speak to us today, especially as a Canadian or someone who's maybe not in the American context. Another thing that, that Baldwin often talks about that I really like is we talk a lot today about privilege and who's privileged. Uh, and, and one of the things he says is that nobody who's in like the oppressor class, like when we look at that kind of rhetoric, if you're actually oppressing someone, that can't be privilege, right? So he's like, I actually, to, to flip this on its head, it's not just about feeling sorry for those who are marginalized. It's also feeling empathy and sympathy for those who are doing the marginalizing, right? Um, to be in that oppressive class is its own form of oppression which is a problem. And I think when Baldwin kind of flips it like that and makes you look at yourself like that, um, that to me is, is one of the most powerful things he does in his, his essays and his, his writing. Thank you. Uh, Professor Wood? Well, I didn't have time to talk about this. I wish I had. Baldwin is a master essayist. I think in many ways his essays will perdure <laughs> and as some of his artworks um, won't. Because again, he deals always with the fact that life is a matter of such subtleties, such nuances, such fine gradations of feeling, um, of expression, and above all, complication of motives. No one acts from any pure singular motive. We all act by a conglomeration of often conflicting motives. And that's what, that's what 
Baldwin understands and gets at and uncovers. So all, all power to him. Oh, thank you all then so very much. Um, I, frankly, I would love to keep this going on for another hour, but um, <laughs> thank you all so very much. Thank you all, uh, everybody who is listening to this. And this will be, I hope, not just people listening now, but everybody who can listen to the YouTube uh, recording of this, which will be up within 24 hours. Everybody who's listening ought to get an email and attending about this. If you had questions which were unanswered, please send them to me. I can forward them to the panelists. Um, and keep on listening to later uh, webinars in both of our the National Association of Scholars uh, series. We have one on American history and we have one on the great American novel. Um, our next one, I believe, is going to be on Tuesday on for the great American history uh, series uh, on World War I. And it'll be some weeks later, in fact, I think into uh, um, January when we discuss our next one on literature, which is actually gonna be Marilyn Robinson's Gilead, which was, I believe, mentioned in this. So we're gonna have a fine progression from Go Tell It on the Mountain to Gilead. Um, thank you all so very much. It's been wonderful li listening and learning. Thank you, Chris, very much. Thank you.